in honor of this being lecture number 19, we will be doing Rowell and Wormley problem 13.19. Actually, just a coincidence, but I liked it. So, um, let's just look at the example problem. So, in the textbook, Rowell and Wormley, they have this problem. An electromechanical drive system shown here. Um, is the system we're going to consider. So a motor drives a massive element. Here's a massive element. Here's the motor through a rack and pinion drive, producing a linear velocity of this mass. <clears throat> the rack and pinion drive may be considered lossless and massless. While the load mass has value m, the DC motor produces torque T equals KAI and has significant armature resistance R and inductance L. The motor is connected to a voltage source. So the questions are, um, first we need to form a linear graph for the system and then use impedance methods to drive a transfer function relating the velocity of the mass to the motor input voltage. Um, what are the system undamped natural frequency, omega n, and damping ratio zeta? So <clears throat> we need to use those. Um, we need to find those things. And we're given um, this rather simple system. However, it does have two uh, transducer elements, one motor, which takes the energy from electrical to rotational mechanical. And then we have also this rack and pinion mechanism, which is another type of, of transducer that takes angular velocity to linear velocity. So we have those two, two two-port elements to deal with. So um, otherwise it's pretty straightforward. And the fact that they asked for natural frequency and damping ratio should be a sign that this must end up as a second order system and it better. So let's do that. Um, okay, so let's see if we can draw a linear graph for that. Let's start with the electronic system. Um, we've got ourselves a voltage source. Vs. And said it has a, a, a significant inductance associated with it. So we're going to use a coil resistance. Um, let's do that first. The order of R and L are actually inconsequential for the dynamics. And then we have uh, the motor interaction. So this is our two port elements here. And this comes over into a rotational mechanical system. So we've got some relationship here. And um, we are going to call that transformer ratio 1, TF1. And then we've got uh, this system, which is um, this rotational system actually go back here for a moment. Uh, rotational system doesn't have any angular um, uh, uh, moment of inertia here. Um, so this is sort of massless rack and pinion. So it's going to immediately get turned into linear velocity. And so we actually probably could have drawn this note a little bit more um, presciently. But in any case, we come over here and we end up with a relationship between um, the angular mechanical system and the rotational mechanical system. So let's draw that. And this is going to be transformer ratio 2. The linear mechanical system has that mass associated with it. So we'll go ahead and put in a mass element. And 
that's it. That's all we've got. So not too bad. We do have these two um, transformer ratios. So recall the definition of the transformer elemental equations are here. And so from this, we can determine what TF1 and TF2 are as follows. So the motor, the, the problem told us that there is a motor constant of Ka. Um, it stated that T2 is equal to Ka times I1. Notice that torque and current are related directly, which we expected for a motor because we know a motor is a transformer. Um, since the two through variables are directly related, that means that the two across variables have to be directly related. Uh, is to say that um, TF1 equals negative KA. And we find that by looking at this lower equation here, we see that F1 is equal to negative one over TF F2. Our F1 is I1 and our F2 is T2, um, where F is the generalized through variable. Um, and therefore, the relationship is that um, I1 is equal to 1 over Ka T2, which makes TF1 negative Ka. So that was enough for the motor analysis. We figured that out. Uh, and then also the rack and pinion. Um, the relationship for rack and pinion is that the velocity, linear velocity, is related to the angular velocity through the radius, which is given as r. So we know that v4, so we'll label these uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, sorry, I should have done that earlier, uh, is equal to r times omega 3. This is omega 3, and then this is going to be v4. So uh, looking at this, notice it's transformer because the cross variable is directly related to the cross variable. And if we look at this relationship, V1, or the, um, the, the source side, has to be proportional, directly proportional, with a constant of proportionality TF to V2. And so our V1 is omega 3. Um, our V2 is V4, which makes our TF2 equal 1 over R. Okay. So, those are also in the table. There's a table of these in the system dynamics textbook. I think it's chapter 6, maybe. Um, it's also in my notes on, on this. But in any case, you can look up in the table to find the transformer ratios, or you could derive them as we did sort of here, um, just by talking through it. In any case, we have a linear graph of the system, and we need to find the transfer function. Um, now, we could go through and do an entire analysis, so last semester, so I'm going to box these because they're transformers because we kind of like to do that. Um, just make it look pretty. So if we were to go through the methods of, of uh, finding the full state equations for this and using the um, definition of the matrix transfer function, uh, we could find the transfer function we want, which is the relationship between the velocity of the mass and the s. However, the impedance method actually gives us a little bit more straightforward way to find that relationship. As I mentioned before, and as we did in, in uh, the last example, in part c of the last example, but we're going to do it again here to sort of nail it home. 
I'm first going to describe the general strategy um, without using any, any quote-unquote tricks. Uh, and We'll see what I mean by that. So the general strategy for finding the transfer function without tricks, which is totally valid and totally legit, but it's just um, it just makes this this impedance method only only marginally easier, if easier at all, than finding the full state equations first. So um, that's why I recommend the tricks. Uh, but we'll talk about the general strategy first. So we're not going to use it in this problem, but in general. The first step is to write the impedance-based elemental equations. So just like when we did generalized Ohm's law back in mechatronics, um, we can say that a cross variable which is voltage in the case of an electronic system, velocity for a mechanical system, angular velocity, pressure, temperature, is proportional to, um, with constant of proportionality, the impedance of the element times the through variable. which is the current or the force or the torque or the volumetric flow rate or the heat flow. So those are our three variables. So the cross variable is proportional to the through variable with this impedance as the constant of proportionality, which is the definition of the impedance. And this is um, uh, an example would be for a mass that's Vm the velocity of the mass is proportional to, with constant of proportionality, 1 over ms using the um, uh, uh, I want to say Laplace transform, but it's actually we haven't learned that yet, but the, the s variable when we are looking at transfer functions um, expression of the impedance of uh, multiplied by uh, the force on the mass, which is just F equals MA, uh, where we have written S here um, to stand for that derivative term as we derived previously. And this 1 over MS is known as the impedance of, it might be, um, of the mass element. So, that's what we're working with. And we have uh, um, this sort of relationship with all of the elements. And this is, you know, we call this generalized Ohm's law in the case of electronic system. Um, but we are able to use this for other types of elements as well, as we've learned. Um, so that's step one of this general method. Step two is to write continuity and compatibility equations. And we know how to do those. We could write them. And if we want to write them the minimal set, we should follow, we should do the normal tree, and we should write that minimal set of continuity and compatibility equations. Otherwise, you're going to end up with an excess, or maybe you won't write the correct ones down. You won't have enough information. So you can either have too much information or not enough. If you have used the normal tree, you're able to write down just the right number. Um, that you'll need. Uh, and then step three is to solve for the transfer function from these equations. It's going to be algebraic, of course, because we have no derivatives when we're using impedances. Um, so it's pretty straightforward, typically. However, um, it can get uh, kind of complicated, especially when you have transformers in it, like this, this problem does. Um, but it's doable, and you guys have done things very similar to this. But notice how this is essentially, well, it's most of the steps you have to go through if you were going to find the state equations. So I don't recommend going through that if you can at all help it, which in most cases you can help it. Um, 
And here's how. We're going to use cleverness. We're going to use the across variable divider rule. So if you look back up here, we have an across variable source in series with R and L. And then we go through all of this stuff to get to, to the mass M. And you could write an equivalent impedance for all of that and find the relationship between Vs and V1, okay? Using the across variable divider rule, because then this is in series with this, which is in series with this equivalent impedance. We'll use that relationship, and then we still need to relate V1 to Vm, which is very easy to do just going through these two transformers. So that's our plan. Um, I'll just work through the details now. Um, which is, you know, you guys could just stop watching now because it's uh, all just in the details. But that's our that's our plan. So maybe you should just pause the video and see if you can do it on your own. Um, I will march on though because you can pause me in real life. Or is this real life? I don't know. Anyways, so we've got. If we were to rewrite this with an equivalent impedance for all of that stuff with the transformers and all that got our Vs, we've got our R, we've got our L, and then we've got our, our uh, we'll call it Z1, our impedance um, of the uh, left hand side of the, of the motor, the electronic side of the motor. So from this, we know that V1, okay, a little uh, glitch there. So, a little wrinkle in the space-time continuum. We were saying that V1 of S is related to Vs of S. with the across variable divider rule. Okay, so we have an across variable source and then multiple series elements. So we can relate the across variable source, which in any good transfer function, all transfer functions, you have to have an across variable, uh, excuse me, you have to have a source of some sort. So if you care about the across variable, of the source, then that's what you're looking for. So the across variable source is related to the across variable of any of these elements by, so the ratio of those two, is the impedance of the element that you care about. So Z1 because V1 divided by the sum of all the others. So it's just like well, sum of all of them. So it's just like if you had um, a resistor, uh, three resistors in series, or multiple resistors in series, and you had a voltage source connected, you could use the voltage divider rule. The same thing applies for the uh, cross variable divider rule with impedances. So we are good to go. We know what ZR is, we know what ZL is, we just need Z1. So I'll just write that. So, so we need Z1. So let's find Z1. So if you look at, if you see that Zm, the impedance of the mass element, is reflected, remember that that terminology reflected through two transformer ratios before it gets felt, you could say, at element one. So when you go through that reflection process, you may recall from, I don't remember which lecture number it was, but lecture earlier this week, that you have to multiply the impedance by the transformer ratio squared in order to go through that impedance, or in order to go through that transformer. So 
we will do just that. So Zm is reflected through Tf1 and Tf2 to Z1. Therefore, Z1 is equal to Tf1 squared times Tf2 squared times Zm, which is a very known quantity. It's just 1 over ms. So Tf1, we said, was from up here, negative Ka. So Tf1 squared is going to be Ka squared. Tf2 squared is going to be 1 over r squared. So you're going to end up um, Ka squared divided by r squared times 1 over ms. All right. So that was easy enough. Now we have the following. We have, let's plug in the variables in V1 over Vs, the transfer function from the across variable divider up here. So let's plug in Z1. So we have Ka squared over r squared times 1 over ms divided by ka squared over r squared times 1 over ms plus zr which is just r and zl which is just ls okay Let's simplify that a little bit. Um, we can do that pretty straightforwardly. Um, if we, I'm going to just drop the 1 over m, I'm going to drop the ms down to the denominator here and multiply it through. And I'm going to rearrange a couple of the terms so that we have this ratio. So that we have Ka squared over R squared. So here's Ka squared over R squared. So we just left this term alone. We drop this ms down below. Um, I'm going to rearrange some terms I said. So the ms multiplying by the, multiplying ls is the first term I'm going to write, which is mls soccer squared plus we'll do this term r times m times s plus and then this term has a 1 over ms in the denominator so the ms is cancel so you have ka squared over r squared So that's, that's what we have for the transfer function. But we want Vm over Vs. We want the transfer function from Vs to Vm. We have the transfer function from Vs to V1. However, we can relate V1 to Vm, which is what we want. And we can do that using the transformer relationships. So let's write the transformer relationships uh, for the for the um, pinion rack pinion first, so we know that omega three equals TF two times V four. Okay, that was from way up here. Um, this well with TF two plugged in, so we have that we just need to figure out how to relate this so v4 what is it related to so that's what we're going to look at so v4 well v4 is just vm right so we can just substitute that in let's do that because we want to get to vm so let's write tf2 times vm so that's a good start, but 
we still don't know how to go all the way from uh, uh, V1 to Vm. We just need to go, know how to go from omega-3 to Vm. So let's see if we can get to omega-3 from V1. So we say that V1, whoa, green, don't think so. V1 is equal to um, uh, TF1 times, and this on the other side, so the voltage is related to the angular velocity, right? So omega 2. Now, omega 2, and so this was just, uh, oh, I didn't write this before, but that's the, the dual to this equation. The other motor uh, elemental equation is the one that I wrote below. Um, now, if we look up at the, the graph, though, if you have omega 2, that's equal to omega 3, right? And that's good news because that means we can relate omega 2 and omega 3. We just learned how to, to relate omega 3 to omega 4, which we just learned to relate to omega, or sorry, not omega 4. It's V4 to Vm. So that means we know how to go from V1 to omega 2 to omega 3 to V4 to Vm. Got it? Follow that? Tracking. All right. So, TF1 omega 3. And notice that this is the other half of the bridge then. So, we'll go from V1 to omega 3. This one takes us from omega 3 to Vm. And we are off to the races. So substituting one, this equation, into this equation, you get that V1 is equal to TF1 times TF2 times Vm, which if we plug in for TF1 and TF2, we get negative Ka over R times Vm. So let's plug that in for V1 up here, and that will allow us to relate Vm and Vs. So, we have the ratio, whoa, the ratio, one more time, third time is the charm. So, negative Ka over R times Vm divided by Vs equals, so, I just plugged in this expression that we just derived into this for V1. Divided by Vs equals, and then we're just going to rewrite this, Ka squared over R squared divided by MLS squared plus R MS plus Ka squared over R squared. Okay, um, so all we need to do is divide both sides by negative Ka over R, and we have ourselves a transfer function. So we have Vm over Vs. Both functions of S, we're just suppressing that S right now because we're being lazy, that's why negative Ka over R. Notice one of the Ka's, one of the R's canceled and the sign got flipped, but that's the only effect we have. We still have soccer going on down here. And um, this entire denominator essentially was untouched as we would expect. Ka squared over R squared. So whoop. And so that is our transfer function. Um, this is part of the answer. I think it asked for the transfer function. But it did. It definitely asked for um, the damping ratio and natural frequency. Notice this did end up being second order because we have in the denominator of our transfer function, we have a second order polynomial. And 
If we write that second order polynomial in standard form, then we will be able to derive what zeta and omega n are. So you may recall standard form from the second order systems chapter, chapter nine. So let's do that by dividing the entire denominator or and numerator by ml because we need to get the coefficient of the s squared term to be one. So we need to divide everything by ml. So the numerator becomes negative ka divided by rml. The denominator becomes s squared plus r over l s plus ka squared. There's just no simplifying on this part. ka squared times 1 over um, ml. So standard form says that we can write the denominator of a second order transfer function as s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. So we know that this omega n squared has to be equal to this term and 2 zeta omega n has to be equal to this term. Which means that therefore omega n squared equals ka squared over r squared times 1 over ml. And if we solve that for omega n, we find that omega n equals ka over r times 1 over, so we've got omega n. That was one of the things requested of us. Um, now we just need to find zeta. So we know from this equality that 2 zeta omega n has to equal r over l. And if you solve that for zeta, zeta equals r over 2l times 1 over omega n. And we know what omega n is from here, so we can simply substitute that and that substitution yields that r over, whoa, I like the blue, r over 2l multiplied by r times, multiplied by r times root ml, the reciprocal here, um, divided by ka. which gives us, with a little simplification, the L's combined, for instance, we get R, R, also known as the double R. If somebody can tell me what that is a reference to without Google, I will be impressed. I don't know if I have any bounty to give you because it's too easy to Google, but anyways, it's a fun reference. It's a reference to my favorite TV show of all time. So you can find out a little tidbit about me. Um, okay, that is the whole thing. So we found out what omega n is, we found out what zeta is. It's a second order system, so it has those two parameters. And yeah, it wasn't too hard to get there. Um, we got to that transfer function really quickly. We had to recognize a couple things. There was a little bit of, uh, of, of cleverness involved. 
But if we ever got stuck, we could always go back and do the full thing. We could find the state equations, or we could just settle to do the um, um, this method, which is um, without tricks, a little longer, well, quite a bit longer, but it does get you there eventually. I definitely recommend trying to use the across variable and through variable divider rules, however, try to get comfortable with them. I think that they'll serve you very well. And on an exam, it's the type of thing that would really speed up the process for you. All right, guys, uh, you guys have a good Sunday, and I will see y'all tomorrow. I'm sure you'll watch this tonight. Good night, guys.